I'm just a person that's uh, kind of carrying the baton right now and hopefully I'll be passing it on to a new generation with a little bit more progress being made uh, than we are where we stand today. We have to push through this if we want to be a better unit. That black Americans are not second class citizens. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live on this Friday before Martin Luther King Day. Uh, I'm Karen Atia and I'm the Global Opinions Editor for the Washington Post. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Alabama Mayors Stephen Reed of Montgomery and Randall Woodfin of Birmingham to talk about Dr. King's legacy and where America finds itself today, a question that many of us have been grappling with over the last year and, and recent days. Now their cities, Montgomery and Birmingham, were central in the fight for civil rights from the 1950s to the present day. And uh, I just want to thank you both uh, for joining me today and, and to just introduce you all to, to our audience um, very quickly. Um, mayor Stephen Reed of Montgomery, Alabama is Montgomery's first African-American mayor. And upon his election in October 2019, then Senator Kamala Harris congratulated Reed on making history in Montgomery. Um, my colleague Megan Flynn said his victory reverberated well beyond Montgomery as many celebrated the milestone in a city remembered as both the cradle of the Confederacy and uh, the birthplace of the civil rights movement. And Montgomery is a city where 60% of residents are black was the first capital of the Confederate States of America, but also uh, is a symbol for protests and resistance for the civil rights era. So thank you so much for joining me. And um, Mayor Randall Woodfin of Birmingham, Alabama, who happens to be the youngest mayor in the city's history. Uh, he grew up in a Birmingham neighborhood uh, and attended Morehouse um, College in Atlanta, the same alma mater as Dr. King and Mayor Reed, actually. After attending law school, he worked as a criminal prosecutor, a community organizer, and president of the Birmingham City Board of Education. Again, thank you both uh, so much for joining us today. Uh, I want to get to, to uh, the questions just about reflecting on uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his energy, his zeal, his passion, for uh, for civil rights at such a young age. Um, and I'd like to put this question to uh, you, Mayor Reed, um, given that Montgomery was the first uh, battleground in the civil rights era. Can you can you talk about, you know, you entered local government at such a young age? Uh, what drove you to do that? And, you know, did studying about Martin Luther King Jr. at all inspire you to join politics? Absolutely. And uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be on with you and Mayor Woodfin. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to talk about the, the legacy of Dr. King. I think all of us are, are heirs to that legacy. And, you know, I, I went to Morehouse in part because uh, my father told my older brother, who also graduated Morehouse, that if Morehouse is good enough for Martin King, it's good enough for you. And uh, even though that wasn't my time uh, to be looking at a college, I kind of knew uh, that the path was set for me at that point. And I think after um, matriculating through Morehouse and learning more about Dr. King, both as a student and as a leader, uh, one could not be uh, inspired by what he had done. Even coming from Montgomery, I just learned a lot more. And I think when I considered what he had done at the age of 26 in leading the Montgomery Improvement Association at such a tumultuous time, I kind of thought about myself and whether or not I could have done that. And the answer is no. Now, I know I couldn't have uh, at that age, in particular, given the challenges that uh, the citizens of Montgomery were dealing with and what changes they sought. And giving oneself to public service became a way for me to create change that I was not able to make uh, or I was not able to influence from outside of uh, my position in elected office. And so I came uh, to elected office as a probate judge, a countywide probate judge, uh, which is the chief election official in this county as well. And I came with a sense of really wanting to change outcomes. 
And when I ran for mayor, I, wear, I ran for mayor with the distinct reason because I wanted to be the thermostat and not the thermometer. And I wanted to make sure that I could put my finger on the scales of justice and fairness uh, in a more equitable way for people who for 200 years in this city's history have felt left out of that. Mary, your father was a civil rights advocate and, and a trailblazer as well. He was part of the Montgomery um, City Council. Uh, and I read that, you know, even as, as a child, uh, that your family received death threats even from the work that your father um, had done. I mean, can you speak about what it was like to, to, to grow up with that, to see that? Well, it was certainly challenging, you know, for us. You know, we, we have uh, a unique set of ties to the King family. My mother is from Perry County in Marion, Alabama, where Mrs. King is from. And so uh, some of her older siblings had gone to Lincoln Normal School uh, and to Lincoln School with uh, Mrs. Scott at that time. And so my father first met Dr. King as a student leader, as the SGA president at Alabama State University, leading the sit-ins. Uh, with other students here from uh, an HBCU. And Dr. King uh, saw some leadership and saw some potential in him. And so I think for us growing up in the shadow of Dr. King's assassination, in particular for my father, um, as well as that of Megar Evers and others, uh, was a real and present danger. But I, I want to say that, you know, the, the irony here is that, you know, just last year, uh, Mayor Woodfin had to deal with a situation where someone threatened him uh, after some protests, after he was leading, and that person had to be arrested. And here we are again, um, where lawmakers are being threatened. And so unfortunately, you know, we've made progress since that time, uh, but we know we live under the constant threat of that violence, uh, unfortunately, even now because of the nature of, of politics and certainly the nature of the language that's been communicated by some um, who disagree with the outcomes of the election and who disagree with the outcomes of certain political positions that you take. Yeah, and I definitely want to, to come back to, to the present conflict and, and the perils in some ways that we're um, being faced with in this country. Um, mayor Woodfin, I, I want to turn to you again as uh, the youngest mayor in Birmingham's history at only 39. I mean, I would love to, to hear from you, uh, similar to, to Dr. Martin Luther King, um, at such a young age, what has driven you to, to public service? Well, first, let me say good morning. Um, thanks for allowing me to be on with you as well as Mary Reed, uh, someone who I look up to and is a big brother. Um, I will tell you that um, first, today is Dr. King's birthday, so happy birthday to Dr. King. Um, I am reminded that um, Mary Reed and I had the opportunity to both um, be students on a small, college on the Red Clay Hill called Morehouse College, where, you know, it's not only at the intersection of academic rigor, but it's also at that intersection meets leadership and community service. And I would say, without a doubt, of all the alums that have attended Morehouse College, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, really personifies that intersection of academic rigor, leadership, and community service. And I think for Mayor Reed and I, just being in a position of being mayors in our hometowns where we were born, where we grew up, we understand um, what Dr. King, um, not only his legacy, but the, the, the to being the torchbearer now, what we must do in our positions. That being the case, um, you know, becoming mayor at 36, being 39 years of age now, um, there's still a sense of urgency uh, to do the right thing on behalf of the people you represent. When you consider Dr. King um, and his legacy and, and where activism meets having to work with elected officials at every level for him, not just fighting mayors and county commissioners and public safety commissioners such as Bull Connor, but having access all the way to the White House and, and finally over the years of courting Kennedy, getting him to where he needed to be, um, before President Johnson did the right thing. Um, there's so much for us to do um, for King's legacy. And so um, whether it's our age, for me at age 39 now, I am reminded Dr. King came into Morehouse at 16, um, started leading, leading the movements in his 20s and did not live long enough to even um, see um, what would become of all the things he did. And so 
um, there's always pressure in this position um, when you look up to a person like Dr. King and you know what he must do. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go to, uh, you know, Birmingham being the site for some of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s most famous words. Of course, we know um, in his famous letter from the Birmingham jail, which is uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Um, Mayor Woodfin, I mean, what do you think when you, you hear these words or, or, or from that, that very famous uh, letter, um, how, why were those words so transformational at that time? And how does that resonate for you today? Well, I think at that time, um, Black people were, were relegated to second class, third class citizens, by having the right to vote having the right to participate in certain things um, as second-class citizens, um, that form of injustice um, made America not be the country it's supposed to be on behalf of all Americans. I think when you apply that and make that applicable in 2020, um, when you look at George Floyd's death, um, when you look at the carnage of the, uh, what the global health pandemic has exposed, when you look at the economic crisis and what it has exposed, is that there is still an overwhelming amount of inequality as well as injustice that exists in America. And the thing that Dr. King was fighting for, not just um, civil rights and voting rights of the time then, uh, but when you look at the, the character and who we are as a country now, many things that are left unresolved, that King, um, King's mission, his legacy, that we, um, Mayor Reed and I, are still fighting for because the amount of injustice at various levels in our country is overwhelming. Um, Mayor Reed, I'd, I'd love to, to come to you on this, uh, a broader question, I think, about um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy. And, and very often, I think we have, uh, sometimes we perhaps misunderstand or even whitewash, you know, sometimes just how radical Martin Luther King Jr. was for his time. We forget, um, or perhaps we choose to misremember, that he was hated by a large portion of, of white America. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm just, you know, wondering, you know, are there ways that we actually sometimes do Martin Luther King's legacy and memory and injustice when we kind of, you know, people say, well, you know, let's calm down on the protest. Martin Luther King wouldn't have wanted these sort of protests, things like that. Um, so yes, how how are we how how are we sometimes whitewashing and 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 misremembering what Martin Luther King Jr. stood for? Well, you know, we we whitewash what Dr. King stood for because it makes most of those who are doing the washing feel better uh, about the way things were then and the way things are right now. And so we sanitize that uh, message uh, in a way that only captures one of the thousands of speeches that he gave. And even out of that speech, uh, we take kind of uh, a few lines out of the speech that he gave uh, at the March on Washington. And that's all we um, utilize him for. We don't think about the books that he wrote. We don't think about the other speeches that he gave, uh, the other sermons that he gave at Riverside uh, Church in, in New York, or speaking of the two Americas in a speech at Stanford University in, in 1967. Uh, we don't think about those things about economic equality, uh, inequality that he really fought for and really making sure that he stayed in touch um, with the movement, whether that was the Poor People's Campaign in Chicago, whether that was why he was coming back to Memphis where he was uh, cowardly assassinated. So we have to make sure, I think, that we view Dr. King from maybe a reluctant leader uh, at 26 and, and taking over. Um, and running the Montgomery bus boycott and leading that all the way through um, him writing a letter from a Birmingham jail and what he called on um, the Christian and the faith leaders to do. Some might put them in the space of white evangelicals now to do, those that called him a rabble rouser, outside agitator, and others, all the way through where he was in his protest against the Vietnam War uh, leading up to the end of his uh, premature 
uh, life at, at the age of 39 in 1968. So I think we have to be very deliberate and intentional in looking at his words and how he grew uh, and the things that he saw, as well as the frustrations that he had uh, with some of the lack of racial progress and political progress that he saw in the resistance that he met even after uh, Oslo and winning the Nobel Peace Prize, even after the I Have a Dream speech and leading uh, a nonviolent peaceful protest in the March on Washington. Uh, so we have to think about him, I think, in, in a complete frame versus just kind of a, a snippet, if you will, or a little clip out of a speech given um, at the March on Washington or one or two others that are often used as being the holistic version of Dr. King, because that was not the case. Yes, Mayor Woodfin, I'd, I'd love to, to hear what you think about that. You know, of course, in the bur letter from a Birmingham jail, um, Martin Luther King wrote, justice too long delayed is too long denied. So yeah, what is the, the right, honest, clear way to remember Martin Luther King, especially in the times that we're finding ourselves now? The right way to remember Dr. King, um, just plain as what I can say is Dr. King was a genuine activist, all right? He wasn't a protester, he was an activist. You know, activists are very intentional about their work. They're deliberate. Uh, he was an organizer, uh, he was a planner. Um, I just finished reading a book probably about a few months ago, King and Kennedy. It's by an author by the last name of Livingston. The book is actually about three, four years um, old, uh, but it speaks to the intersection of the civil rights movement and pretty much um, the, the courtship King developed with um, President Kennedy. And, and President Kennedy was actually called towards civil rights movement and how he had to build towards um, embracing doing the right thing. And it was King. We know a lot of the work we see about Dr. King. Um, we, we don't know a lot of the behind the scenes work he did with the calls, um, with the organizing. Um, we know what happened in Albany. We know what happened in Montgomery. We know what happened in Birmingham. There was so much more going on as it relates to organizing financial efforts. Um, the speeches he did across um, the, the, the world, if, if, if you will allow me to say that. Um, the things he said at college campuses, et cetera. Um, there was real work being done. And one of the things um, that I appreciated the most is that um, with, even with Robert Kennedy and Dr. King, um, real work had to be done uh, to, to engage in some of the things that made the civil rights movement successful. And so King's activism does not um, work without actually pushing the federal government, the White House and the Department of Justice to do the right thing. And so at the root of Dr. King's legacy, I would say that Activism requires intentionality. It requires resources, planning, being strategic, and it requires partnership. And I think that's a lot of things people don't really understand about Dr. King's legacy. It wasn't just rooted in a speech. It wasn't rooted in speeches. Um, it wasn't rooted just in the, in the um, pulpit of his sermons. It was rooted in organizing and, and moving people. I think that's that's so key and so important that it wasn't just nice speeches and, and heartwarming, you know, uh, sound bites, but that he was really working at all, all levels of government to, to push forward for civil rights. I want to bring, um, you know, speaking of, you know, what Dr. Martin Luther King called the long um, moral arc of, of the universe um, to today and to the recent um, events. Um, and I want to actually uh, stay with you, uh, Mayor Woodfin. Um, what was your reaction um, as we watched what happened at the U.S. Capitol, as we watched uh, mobs of extremists carrying the Confederate flag, uh, you know, people who, not all, but plenty enough, who uh, identified themselves as white supremacists uh, marching through the U.S. Capitol last week um, and causing damage and um, ending up with five people losing their lives. I mean, what was going through your mind when you saw those images coming out of the U.S. Capitol? I'm not, I'm not going to be politically correct with you. I was pissed. 
I was I was angry. I was mad. Um, and I'll tell you what made me originally mad. Um, um, the, the president took the time to record a video to say, um, we love you. We love you to people who committed, um, in my mind, acts of domestic terrorism, who, who committed, you know, just the way they descended upon our capital. Um, it was illegal. It was morally wrong. Um, it was it was bad for our country. Um, and so um, I didn't like it. I think what what our country experienced last week um, was a reckoning um, that need to be that needs to be addressed. It's not something you can whitewash. It's not something you can tap on a hand and say, oh, let's just move on. Um, you know, it was just caught up in the moment. No, um, I feel like a lot of this was planned. A lot of this was acted upon and everybody who participated need to be held responsible and accountable. Don't tell me, don't speak to me about um, reconciliation and it's time to heal unless you want to first speak to accountability in your role in what happened. Mm -hmm. Mayor Reed, I'd love to get your take and specifically um, how you saw the reactions of, of law enforcement um to to the storming of the capitol and then i'd love to you know you know, as, as being in um being in a state capital yourself um are you worried uh for your safety Have, is there anything you can tell us um about any possible threats uh to the capital in alabama well i i, I think from from our standpoint I, i'll go in reverse order we're certainly taking precautions and we have been for uh, the last couple of, of months uh, to prepare for inauguration day after the state capitol was stormed in Michigan, in Lansing, Michigan, uh, that was somewhat of a wake up call for us. Um, and we tried to prepare and work with our state law enforcement agencies uh, on things that we could do to prevent that from happening. And when you look at what happened in, in Michigan earlier this year, obviously the threats that came out towards uh, the governor afterwards and other lawmakers um, we understood that this was a, a different time. This is a different moment because things were a little more serious, if you will. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, federal judges house in New Jersey, someone show up there and, and, and kill a family member. We've had a federal judge here killed in the past. Uh, Bob Vance, uh, former leader of the Democratic Party here, was killed decades ago, a friend of our family. Um, so when you think of acts of domestic terrorism, whether it's Timothy McVeigh or others, we have to take in context what that really is masking. It's masking this anti-government uh, feeling that's out there that feels that government is taking something from people. And so when you fast forward that to where we are today, we have really seen what happened or what took place at the uh, U.S. Capitol, and we've had to prepare even more. Uh, now we're working with federal officials. Now we're looking at um, civil rights sites. We're looking at other monuments. We're making sure that we're not just focused on uh, the Capitol, but also municipal buildings. We have to look at um, you know, other federal buildings as well. So we're taking all the precautions we can here. And if I can just get to your, your uh, initial question about how I felt, you know, I, I felt that this was um, a, a very ironic uh, situation to have that type of vitriol and anger shown at the Capitol to where people would feel like they could even get close enough to do it. There was a level of privilege. There was a level of entitlement. There was a level of, of, of just really outright brazenness to even think about that. Because I put myself in the position that many mayors around this country were in when the Black Lives Matters protesters um, really wanted to protest police uh, community relations and police reform uh, in this country just a few months ago. And I thought if I had said what a President Trump had said or what the congressman from North Alabama in the Huntsville area, Mo Brooks, had said, and I, I believe that if I had said anything close to that, um, I would have been asked to resign. People would be trying to force me to resign now. And so I think that to have the arsonist uh, light the match and then to come back, at least in President Trump's case, he's at least pretended like he doesn't want there to be any violence. In the case of uh, Alabama Congressman Mo Brooks, there has even been no, uh, you know, even fake uh, effort to act like he didn't care. It's very ironic to see what that led to versus 
what has happened over not just the course of the last few months, but over the course of history in terms of other marches, whether it be uh, people of other religions, people protesting immigration, people who didn't look like those who were trying to break down the gates of the Capitol, what would have happened then? And I do believe that the outcome would have been much more deadly. I believe there would have been much more force used. And I believe that we would be talking about a massacre now instead of a uh, insurrection or an attempted coup that took place last week. And so very ironic in terms of how that was handled. And I do believe a full investigation um, is necessary uh, by our Congress and by our federal authorities. And I hope they impose the maximum penalties on every last person that was involved mm -hmm. in the desecration of our democracy and the attempted overturning of a constitutional uh, responsibility of our Congress. Our legislative branch was in that building uh, probably for one time and one of the very few times that they are other than the State of the Union all at the same time. That could have been disastrous and everyone accountable, be they lawmakers, be they police officers or be they protesters, should be held to the maximum penalty. Yeah. And I, I want to turn quickly, uh, I mean, I, this is a question that really could have a hour long answer, but both of you uh, mayors have been involved in uh, whether it's renaming uh, streets um, in, in honor of civil rights, uh, civil rights um, figures or uh, taking down Confederate monuments. Um, and I want to turn to uh, Woodfin and if you can answer, you know, very quickly, does what we saw at the Capitol underscore the need for, in some ways, um, 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 I mean, some would say, you know, the Confederacy and, and Confederate uh, sympathies are still very much alive and well. So does this give um, uh, more force to your efforts to remove Confederate statues? And just how do you how do you see how do you see that? Um, it's very simple and direct. Um, where we are in America as a country right now to move forward, um, we have no room or place for second place trophies or the Confederacy. Um, that's just not, it's un-American. It's even treasonous to even consider, consider the thoughts of where to talk about um, that place in America's history. Uh, we need to move forward as a country, we need to move forward as states and as communities and legislators um, across the country who want to continue this championing of the Confederacy place need to remember um, that um, the Confederates uh, committed treason. They actually lost the war. We don't have time for second place trophies in public squares. And we're tired of talking about it. It's time to talk about something else. All right, and we're coming almost to the end, but I have one uh, last question and I'll, I'll give this to you, um, Mayor Reed. Um, President-elect Biden has spoken of, of healing the nation and, and rebuilding trust. How do we move forward? Uh, how, what is, wh what is the way forward from all of this? I think it's hard to heal without some atonement. And I think we have to, uh, you know, make sure that that is clear. And I believe we have to be honest and forthright. And President Biden, I believe, has a leadership. Certainly, uh, with his vice president uh, elect, uh, Kamala Harris, as well, uh, I think to provide what's needed, um, the stability, but also the truthfulness that needs to be said and to institute uh, substantive policy changes that help everyday Americans understand how we improve and how we get uh, to a better America, how we get to Dr. King's beloved community. Uh, right now, I, I believe that uh, we, we're in the throes of a new reconstruction. And it's something that we have to be very honest and very candid about. And I think learn from the history of the uh, first reconstruction to understand what we need to do going forward and what it will call Americans as well as our leaders uh, to do to show courage in order for us to get to the outcome we'd like to see. Thank you. And Mayor Woodfin, in 30 seconds or less, what would you say as the way uh, forward for this nation? I think I agree with Mayor Reed. In, or, in order um, you know, to get to a place of healing, you first have to acknowledge what happened, what's happened. Um, there has been a lot of intentional pain inflicted on separating families over the last four years. There's been a lot of intentional 
um, display of white supremacy and so many other things of suppressing people's ability to um, opportunity to vote and opportunity to participate in the American dream. And I can go on and on what's happened over the last four years. I am 100% all for healing and moving our country forward. Um, but I think in order to do that, um, there has to be some acknowledgement of, of the pain that's been caused, um, some accountability towards that pain, and then let's move forward. Um, I am 100% in support of our new president-elect, as well as the vice president-elect. Um, and I am looking forward to, as mayors, Mayor Reed and I are working with the new federal administration on moving the country forward, healing our country, and making things work better for our citizens. We serve both here in Birmingham and Montgomery. Great, right, thank you so much. Uh, we could go for hours on so many of these topics, but unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today. Mayor Reed, Mayor Woodfin, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, tune in next Thursday for the next installment of our Race in America series with author Angie Thomas. Again, I'm Karen Atia, and thank you for watching Washington Post Live.